Look at that. Thank you, Adrian. There we go. Okay, let's talk about some basics today. A little while back I did a video on how you can combine 12, 24 and 5 volt components in the same setup and on that video a bunch of you asked in the comments why ATX computer power supplies aren't really used anymore in 3D printer builds. So let's try and find out what had these falling out of favor and check out some of the things you can do with an ATX supply that would be really tricky with these simpler industrial types. All right, ATX supplies versus these industrial type power supplies. There are a few pros and cons to each one, and it's not like one is always clearly better than the other. So let's start out with the obvious differences. First off, ATX supplies have a standardized shape that is kind of bulky in every direction. Uh, the more power you get from these, the longer they get, but the front element is always the same size. Um, but the industrial supplies are slimmer, but also a bit longer. Um, that often makes it easier for them to tuck him underneath, uh, for example, a heated bed like down here, uh, but the ATX form factor can work really well on some printer builds too. For example, on the Mendel 90, 9000, this entire rear pillar is the perfect size for it. So just, you know, typically this type of form factor can be used a bit more flexibly. There are also other PC power supply form factors that are made to plug into the same type of motherboard and components. For example, the TFX size I have here, or SFX, which is just a shrunken down version of the ATX size. But those are typically a bit more expensive though. Now, the other difference you can see right away is that the ATX supplies have a set of wires that they come with. Some of the better units are modular, so you can just plug in uh, the wiring looms that you actually need, but typically all of these are permanently attached to the supply. On more powerful supplies, the wiring itself can take up as much space as the unit itself because, you know, you, you get enough connectors for like 20 hard drives, 4 graphics cards, 2 mainboards and 12 floppy drives. Uh, I always find it a bit heartbreaking to cut off the connectors from a perfectly good power supply, but the plugs on here really are only used in computer parts. Also, just one wire by itself cannot handle the entire output power. So if you need more than 100 or 200 watts, you'll have to splice together wires from different plugs and that can get really messy really easily. More on that in a second, as there's more to it, but one upside of having standard connectors is on the input side, where you've got the standard IEC receptacle. So at least on the mains, high voltage side, you have a really easy, clean and safe way to plug in. The industrial supplies just come with a bunch of screw clamps up here uh, that you can tighten onto crimp connectors or bare wire, but not onto tin wire. But that is both for the AC high voltage mains input uh, as well as the DC output. So you will have to hook up mains to it yourself too. On the upside though, each of these clamps on the output can carry the entire output current basically with a single wire as long as the wire itself can handle it. Okay, so to expand on why you need to splice together wires on the ATX supply. The industrial supplies and also some simpler ATX units have just what's called a single rail. Basically, one single output for 12 volt. These screw clamps are all tied together. But more commonly on ATX supplies, there are two, three or four 12 volt rails, which are basically several independent supplies. One rail might supply the power for the mainboard and the CPU. Another rail might be for one set of PCIe connectors for the graphics cards and or for this first graphics card. And then another rail for, you know, if you have a second set of PCIe connectors. Now it's not entirely perfect just tying these separate supplies together, uh, these separate rails, but it's going to work to supply more current if you, for example, are powering a large 12 volt heated bed. But to make use of the full output power, you will need to know which connector is tied to which rail and grab power from each of them or just tie all the 12 volt lines together. And another thing that comes along with these supplies being built for computers is that they don't just generate 12 volt. Uh, they also generate 5 volt, 3.3, negative 5 volt, this one apparently doesn't, and negative 12 volt. Those last two ones are often used for audio. Now on cheaper supplies, you'll often find what's called group regulation. In very simplified terms, those power supplies will regulate 
12, 5 and 3.3 volts together so that the voltages are just fixed ratios to one another. That simply saves cost because you only need one big transformer that has multiple secondary windings. But as we start drawing current from 12 volt, uh, the voltage on 12 volt will slightly drop because we start having resistive losses inside the supply. So the supply itself will start trying to compensate for those losses by slightly increasing the voltage it's trying to achieve so that the actual output voltage on the plug will more or less stay constant no matter if you draw 1 amp or 20 amps. But with that group regulation, not only will the power supply compensate for that voltage drop on 12 volts, at the same time it will also increase the output voltage on 5 volt and on 3.3 volt, even though we aren't drawing any current here. The safety mechanisms in the supply are still monitoring those two voltages though, and if they go above the safe limit, it's going to shut itself off completely. And that's not uncommon to happen if you have a cheap supply, this one isn't a super cheap one, and are drawing a good amount of load just from 12 volt. So one way to fix that, and that's been done a lot actually, is to just add a load to 5 volt, for example, on one of the hard drive connectors, and maybe to 3.3 volt. All that needs to be is a resistor that wastes a few watts of power. I mean, I don't think that's very elegant, and I've not had to do it on any of my supplies yet, but then again, I don't usually buy the cheapest ATX supplies because I will probably use them in a PC at some point. Next up, efficiency. If you've got cheap subsidized coal power, then you probably don't care about a few extra watts here and there. Uh, but when you're paying 25 or 30 cents per kilowatt hour, you probably do. Cheap industrial supplies will often claim 85 to 90% efficient, which is hard to believe to say the least. Typically, these only manage about 70% on average. So if you have a printer that needs about 100 watts to run, it will actually draw an extra 43 watts from the wall just for losses inside the power supply. Brand name industrial supplies are a lot better here, like the ones from Delta, Meanwheel, etc. But for ATX supplies, you have the 80 plus certifications, which come in standard bronze, silver, gold, platinum, and titanium. The higher you go up in level, the more efficient the supply will be across its entire load range, between 20 and 100% load. If a cheap supply only tells you one efficiency figure, that's only for peak efficiency at one specific output load, and it will be much less efficient everywhere else. Also, to achieve that better efficiency, 80 plus supplies usually also use better components. Another upside of ATX supplies is the fact that you can switch them off, and not just with that switch on the back, which of course is super convenient too, but by signaling through that green wire on here. Um, so you'll no doubt have seen uh, a wire shoved into the ATX connector like this, uh, or you know one of these jumper connectors that turns on the supply, and there are two incredibly cool things about this. First, we can control that signal with any 3D printer mainboard. Marlin has support for switching on and off an ATX supply built right in, it's right there in the config. So with one GCO command, you can enable all the high power parts on your printer that are connected to that 12 volt or 5 volt line from an ATX supply. And with another, you can turn them off again. And you can even use that as an emergency stop, for example, through Octoprint, but you can also use those G codes in the start and end G codes so that before and after a print, the printer turns itself on and off automatically. That saves some standby power and reduces the risk of anything dramatic going wrong when the printer is just sitting idle. But the cool thing with that is that an ATX supply always provides 5 volt power for your electronics, even when you've switched it off electronically through that green wire. The 5 volt standby line right back here provides enough current for at least your printer control board, and in many cases also enough for a Raspberry Pi so that you don't need a separate power supply for that. This one's also supplying 2.5 amps on the 5 volt standby line, which should be enough for a Raspberry Pi. Maybe not a Pi 4, but still. 5 volt standby is intended for keeping some functions enabled in the computer when it's off, like waiting for a wake on LAN, and more recently also to allow charging through the USB ports. Uh, check your power supply for the exact current rating. So. so, ATX supplies actually sound pretty cool so far, right? Well, there are two more things that are fairly strong arguments against using them. The first one is voltages. Now, printers have been moving to 24 volts. This is actually a 12 volt supply, but 
Prusa 24 volt because that makes it a lot easier to handle powerful beds as you're reducing the current that's needed to get the same output power. But it also gives stepper drivers more headroom to breathe and actually improves the performance for higher movement speeds and fast accelerations in many cases. But of course, ATX supplies are only available with their main output voltage at 12 volt, while you can get these industrial ones in 5, 12, 24, 36, or 48 volts. Now, you or a printer manufacturer can work around that by, for example, carefully selecting the stepper motors and drivers to work well at 12 volts, and that's totally doable, and move to mains powered heated bed, for example. But then, of course, once you do that, you don't even need a power supply as capable as an ATX unit or an industrial one anymore. You can get away with one of these uh, smaller, cheap uh, brick type supplies. This is a 5 amp unit, it runs a printer just fine. And the other factor, of course, is price. These industrial units, these ones, have become incredibly cheap, spurred by an LED strip craze a few years ago and 3D printers coming up around the same time. So I just did a quick search for how much these are right now. Shipped from Germany, taxes included, and a 12 volt 20 amp supply is 14 euros. A 30 amp supply is 16 euros, and a 24 volt 10 amp unit, same rating as the one in the Mark III, is also 16 euros. That is just incredibly hard to beat. Now, of course, that's the bargain bin quality unit. So if you go for one of those, you should always buy one that's rated for at least 30% more than you think you'll need. And also these will age over time and lose some of their opacity as the capacitors dry out. But the same exact thing also applies to super cheap ATX supplies. Now, with those, you have to factor in that, you know, connectors are actually surprisingly expensive, even if you buy them in bulk, which is why modular supplies are so much more expensive than regular ones, typically like 10 or 15 bucks even. So you can get a 500 watt unit rated for 26 amps, so more like 300 watts, of which you should maybe use like 220 uh, for 16 euros plus shipping this time. You can get a 600 watt unit with two 20 amp rails for around 22 euros, and then as we get into the actually decent brand name 80 plus certified units, they start around 32, 35 euros for between 24 or 30 amps of output on 12 volt, plus shipping of course. Now honestly, that's still not super expensive, but at that point you can also get an industrial meanwhile power supply at 12 volt and 20 amp or 24 volt 10 amp for about 40 bucks. Honestly, if you're building a printer, you're okay with a 12 volt system, want a decent supply, and maybe you're thinking about using that, that super cool 5 volt standby line, which I think is a really neat feature, then an APX supply is still a really good choice. But when it comes to printer manufacturers, not only are they probably getting even better deals on industrial supplies in bulk, but for them, a smaller packaging size is also worth a lot as it saves in logistics and dealing with ATX connectors also adds cost and complexity because they'll need to have some solution to plug all the relevant cables in, which of course means making another custom PCB or another wire harness and spending money on the matching connectors again and spending some more time doing assembly. For them, I just think it makes a lot more sense to use the industrial supplies. So, if you've built a printer or customized one, let me know what you've used. Is the option for a 24 volt the deciding factor? Maybe you're also using an ATX supply with a boost converter just for the stepper drivers. Totally makes sense. And before we go, a big shout out to my patrons and YouTube members who make this entire thing possible. Shout outs go to the patrons in the shout out tier. I'll enable member tiers here on YouTube at some point too. Um, but for this one, thank you to Christopher Day, Dorian Gray, Phyllis Struder, Haytham Benani, James C. Foley, Jeffrey Nikolaitis, Jimmy Lee, Jonathan Malin, Marcus Harms, Matthew Oswald, Mike McGee, Olivares, Paul Arden, Printed Solid, Robert Hornburg, Rudolf Wang, Schlange, and William Divine. And of course, everyone else who's supporting on Patreon YouTube memberships or some other way. Without you all, this would literally not be possible. Also, a huge shout out to everyone who's liking, sharing, subscribing. That does make a massive difference too. And as always, I hope you learned something and I will see you all in the next one.